Section 26 of the Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Wolf and the Shepherd. A wolf, lurking near the shepherd's hut, saw the shepherd and his family feasting on a roasted lamb. Aha! he muttered. What a great shouting and running about there would have been had they caught me at just the very thing they are doing with so much enjoyment. Men often condemn others for what they see no wrong in doing themselves. THE GOAT HERD AND THE GOAT A goat strayed away from the flock, tempted by a patch of clover. The goat herd tried to call it back, but in vain. It would not obey him. Then he picked up a stone and threw it, breaking the goat's horn. The goat herd was frightened. Do not tell the master, he begged the goat. No, said the goat. That broken horn can speak for itself. Wicked deeds will not stay hid. The Miser A miser had buried his gold in a secret place in his garden. Every day he went to the spot, dug up the treasure, and counted it piece by piece to make sure it was all there. He had made so many trips that a thief, who had been observing him, guessed what it was the miser had hidden, and one night quietly dug up the treasure and made off with it. When the miser discovered his loss, he was overcome with grief and despair. He groaned and cried and tore his hair. A passerby heard his cries and asked what had happened. "'My gold! Oh, my gold!' cried the miser, wildly. "'Someone has robbed me!' "'Your gold? There in that hole? Why did you put it there? Why did you not keep it in the house where you could easily get it when you had to buy things?' "'Buy!' screamed the miser angrily. "'Why, I never touched the gold. I couldn't think of spending any of it.' The stranger picked up a large stone and threw it into the hole. If that is the case, he said, cover up that stone. It is worth just as much to you as the treasure you lost. A possession is worth no more than the use we make of it. The Wolf and the House Dog There was once a wolf who got very little to eat because the dogs of the village were so wide awake and watchful. He was really nothing but skin and bones, and it made him very downhearted to think of it. One night this wolf happened to fall in with a fine fat house dog who had wandered a little too far from home. The wolf would gladly have eaten him then and there, but the house dog looked strong enough to leave his mark should he try it. So the wolf spoke very humbly to the dog, complimenting him on his fine appearance. You can be as well fed as I am if you want to, replied the dog. Leave the woods. There you live miserably. Why, you have to fight hard for every bite you get. Follow my example, and you will get along beautifully. What must I do? asked the wolf. Hardly anything, answered the house dog. Chase people who carry canes, bark at beggars, and fawn on the people of the house. In return you will get tidbits of every kind chicken bones, choice bits of meat, sugar, cake, and much more besides, not to speak of kind words and caresses. The wolf had such a beautiful vision of his coming happiness that he almost wept. But just then he noticed that the hair on the dog's neck was worn and the skin was chafed. What is that on your neck? Nothing at all, replied the dog. What? Nothing? Oh, just a trifle. But please tell me. Perhaps you see the mark of the collar to which my chain is fastened. What? A chain? cried the wolf. Don't you go wherever you please? Not always. But what's the difference? replied the dog. All the difference in the world. I don't care a rap for your feasts, and I wouldn't take all the tender young lambs in the world at that price. And away ran the wolf to the woods. There is nothing worth so much as liberty. End of section 10. 
Recording by Terry Torres. Section 27 of the Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki Kerno. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Fox and the Hedgehog. A fox, swimming across a river, was barely able to reach the bank, where he lay bruised and exhausted from his struggle with the swift current. Soon a swarm of blood-sucking flies settled on him, but he lay quietly, still too weak to run away from them. A hedgehog happened by. "'Let me drive the flies away,' he said kindly. "'No, no!' exclaimed the fox. Do not disturb them. They have taken all they can hold. If you drive them away, another greedy swarm will come and take the little blood I have left. Better to bear a lesser evil than to risk a greater in removing it. The Bat and the Weasels A bat blundered into the nest of a weasel, who ran up to catch and eat him. The bat begged for his life, but the weasel would not listen. "'You are a mouse,' he said, "'and I am a sworn enemy of mice. "'Every mouse I catch, I am going to eat.' "'Um, but I'm not a mouse,' cried the bat. "'Look at, look at my wings. Can mice fly? "'Why, I am only a bird. Please let me go.' The weasel had to admit that the bat was not a mouse, so he let him go. But a few days later, the foolish bat went blindly into the nest of another weasel. This weasel happened to be a bitter enemy of birds, and he soon had the bat under his claws, ready to eat him. "'You are a bird,' he said, "'and I am going to eat you.' "'What?' cried the bat. "'I? A bird? Why, all birds have feathers. I am nothing but a mouse.' Uh, down with all cats is my motto. And so the bat escaped with his life a second time. Set your sails with the wind. The Quack Toad An old toad once informed all his neighbours that he was a learned doctor. In fact, he could cure anything. The fox heard the news and hurried to see the toad. He looked the toad over very carefully. Mr. Toad, he said, I've been told that you cure anything, but just take a look at yourself and then try some of your own medicine. If you can cure yourself of that blotchy skin and that rheumatic gait, someone might believe you. Otherwise, I should advise you to try some other profession. Those who would mend others should first mend themselves. The Fox Without a Tail A fox that had been caught in a trap succeeded at last, after much painful tugging, in getting away. But he had to leave his beautiful bushy tail behind him. For a long time he kept away from the other foxes, for he knew well enough that they would all make fun of him and crack jokes and laugh behind his back. But it was hard for him to live alone, and at last he thought of a plan that would perhaps help him out of his trouble. He called a meeting of all the foxes, saying that he had something of great importance to tell the tribe. When they were all gathered together, the fox without a tail got up and made a long speech about those foxes who had come to harm because of their tails. This one had been caught by hounds when his tail had become entangled in the hedge. That one had not been able to run fast enough because of the weight of his brush. Besides, it was well known, he said, that men hunt foxes simply for their tails, which they cut off as prizes of the hunt. With such proof of the danger and uselessness of having a tail, said Master Fox, he would advise every fox to cut it off, if he valued life and safety. When he had finished talking, an old fox arose and said, smiling, Master Fox! "'Kindly turn around for a moment, and you shall have your answer.' "'When the poor fox without a tail turned around, 
there arose such a storm of jeers and hooting that he saw how useless it was to try any longer to persuade the foxes to part with their tails. Do not listen to the advice of him who seeks to lower you to his own level. End of section 27. Recording by Nikki Kerno. www.nikikerno.com Section 28 of The Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki Kerno. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Mischievous Dog. There was once a dog who was so ill natured and mischievous that his master had to fasten a heavy wooden clog about his neck to keep him from annoying visitors and neighbours. But the dog seemed to be very proud of the clog, and dragged it about noisily as if he wished to attract everybody's attention. He was not able to impress anyone. "'You would be wiser,' said an old acquaintance, "'to keep quietly out of sight with that clog. Do you want everybody to know what a disgraceful and ill-natured dog you are?' Notoriety is not fame." The Rose and the Butterfly A butterfly once fell in love with a beautiful rose. The rose was not indifferent, for the butterfly's wings were powdered in a charming pattern of gold and silver, and so, when he fluttered near and told her how he loved her, she blushed rosily and said yes. After much pretty love-making and many whispered vows of constancy, the butterfly took a tender leave of his sweetheart. But alas, it was a long time before he came back to her. <laughs> is this your constancy? she exclaimed tearfully. It is ages since you went away, and all the time you have been carrying on with all sorts of flowers. I saw you kiss Miss Geranium, and you fluttered around Miss Mignonette until Honeybee chased you away. I wish he had stung you. <laughs> constancy, laughed the butterfly. I had no sooner left you than I saw Zephyr kissing you. You carried on scandalously with Mr. Bumblebee, and you made eyes at every single bug you could see. You can't expect any constancy from me. Do not expect constancy in others, if you have none yourself. The Cat and the Fox Once a cat and a fox were travelling together. As they went along, picking up provisions on the way, a stray mouse here, a fat chicken there, they began an argument to while away the time between bites, and, as usually happens when comrades argue, the talk began to get personal. <laughs> you think you're extremely clever, don't you? said the fox. Do you pretend to know more than I? Why, I know a whole sack full of tricks. Well, retorted the cat, I admit I know one trick only, but that one, let me tell you, is worth a thousand of yours. Just then, close by, they heard a hunter's horn and the yelping of a pack of hounds. In an instant, the cat was up a tree, hiding among the leaves. This is my trick, he called to the fox. Now let me see what yours are worth. But the fox had so many plans for escape, he could not decide which one to try first. He dodged here and there with the hounds at his heels. He doubled on his tracks. He ran at top speed. He entered a dozen burrows. But all in vain. The hounds caught him and soon put an end to the boaster and all his tricks. Common sense is always worth more than cunning. The Boy and the Nettle a boy, stung by a nettle, ran home crying to get his mother to blow on the hurt and kiss it. Son, said the boy's mother when she had comforted him, the next time you come near a nettle, grasp it firmly and it will be as soft as silk. Whatever you do, do with all your might. End of section 28. Recording by Nikki Kerno. www.nikikerno.com
Section 29 of the Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Old Lion. A lion had grown very old. His teeth were worn away. His limbs could no longer bear him, and the king of beasts was very pitiful indeed as he lay gasping on the ground, about to die. Where now his strength and his former graceful beauty? Now a boar spied him, and rushing at him, gored him with his yellow tusk. A bull trampled him with his heavy hoofs. Even a contemptible ass let fly his heels and brayed his insults in the face of the lion. It is cowardly to attack the defenseless, though he be an enemy. The fox and the pheasants. One moonlight evening, as Mr. Fox was taking his usual stroll in the woods, he saw a number of pheasants perched quite out of his reach on the limb of a tall old tree. The sly fox soon found a bright patch of moonlight where the pheasants could see him clearly. There he raised himself up on his hind legs and began a wild dance. First he whirled round and round like a top. Then he hopped up and down, cutting all sorts of strange capers. The pheasants stared giddily. They hardly dared blink for fear of losing him out of their sight a single instant. Now the fox made as if to climb a tree. Now he fell over and laid still, playing dead, and the next instant he was hopping on all fours, his back in the air, and his bushy tail shaking so that it seemed to throw out silver sparks in the moonlight. By this time the poor bird's heads were in a whirl, and when the fox began his performance all over again, so dazed did they become that they lost their hold on the limb and fell down one by one to the fox. Too much attention to danger may cause us to fall victims to it. Two Travelers and a Bear Two men were traveling in company through a forest when all at once a huge bear crashed out of the brush near them. One of the men, thinking of his own safety, climbed a tree. The other, unable to fight the savage beast alone, threw himself on the ground and lay still, as if he were dead. He had heard that a bear will not touch a dead body. It must have been true, for the bear snuffed at the man's head a while, and then, seeming to be satisfied that he was dead, walked away. The man in the tree climbed down. It looked just as if that bear whispered in your ear, he said. What did he tell you? He said, answered the other, that it was not at all wise to keep company with a fellow who would desert his friend in a moment of danger. Misfortune is the test of true friendship. The Porcupine and the Snakes A porcupine was looking for a good home. At last he found a little sheltered cave where lived a family of snakes. He asked them to let him share the cave with them, and the snakes kindly consented. The snakes soon wished they had not given him permission to stay. His sharp quills pricked them at every turn, and at last they politely asked him to leave. I am very well satisfied, thank you, said the porcupine. I intend to stay right here. And with that, he politely escorted the snakes out of doors. And to save their skins, the snakes had to look for another home. Give a finger and lose a hand. 
End of section 29. Recording by Mary. Section 30 of the Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claire. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Fox and the Monkey. At a great meeting of the animals who had gathered to elect a new ruler, the monkey was asked to dance. This he did so well, with a thousand funny capers and grimaces, that the animals were carried entirely off their feet with enthusiasm, and then and there elected him their king. The fox did not vote for the monkey, and was much disgusted with the animals for electing so unworthy a ruler. One day he found a trap with a bit of meat in it. Hurrying to King Monkey, he told him he had found a rich treasure which he had not touched because it belonged by right to His Majesty the monkey. The greedy monkey followed the fox to the trap. As soon as he saw the meat, he grasped eagerly for it, only to find himself held fast in the trap. The fox stood off and laughed. You pretend to be our king, he said, and cannot even take care of yourself. Shortly after that, another election among the animals was held. The true leader proves himself by his qualities. The Mother and the Wolf Early one morning a hungry wolf was prowling around a cottage at the edge of a village, when he heard a child crying in the house. Then he heard the mother voice say, Hush, child, hush! Stop your crying, or I will give you to the wolf. Surprised but delighted at the prospect of so delicious a meal, the wolf settled down under an open window, expecting every moment to have the child handed out to him. But though the little one continued to fret, the wolf waited all day in vain. Then, toward nightfall, he heard the mother's voice again, as she sat down near the window to sing and rock her baby to sleep. There, child, there! The wolf shall not get you. No, no, Daddy is watching, and Daddy will kill him if he should come near. Just then the father came within sight of the home, and the wolf was barely able to save himself from the dogs by a clever bit of running. Do not believe everything you hear. The Flies and the Honey A jar of honey was upset, and the sticky sweetness flowed out on the table. The sweet smell of the honey soon brought a large number of flies buzzing around. They did not wait for an invitation. No, indeed, they settled right down, feet and all, to gorge themselves. The flies were quickly smeared from head to foot with honey. Their wings stuck together. They could not pull their feet out of the sticky mess, and so they died, giving their lives for the sake of a taste of sweetness. Be not greedy for a little passing pleasure. It may destroy you. THE EAGLE AND THE KITE An eagle sat high in the branches of a great oak. She seemed very sad and drooping for an eagle. A kite saw her. "'Why do you look so woebegone?' asked the kite. "'I want to get married,' replied the eagle, "'but I can't find a mate who can provide for me as I should like.' "'Take me,' said the kite. "'I am very strong, stronger even than you.' "'Do you really think you can provide for me?' asked the eagle eagerly. Why, of course, replied the kite, that would be a very simple matter. I am so strong I can carry away an ostrich in my talons as if it were a feather. The eagle accepted the kite immediately, but after the wedding, when the kite flew away to find something to eat for his bride, all he had when he returned was a tiny mouse. Is that the ostrich you talked about? asked the eagle in disgust. To win you I would have said and promised anything, replied the kite. Everything is fair in love. End of section 30. Recording by Claire. Section 32 of the Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. THE HARE AND THE TORTOISE A hare was making fun of the tortoise one day for being so slow. "'Do you ever get anywhere?' he asked with a mocking laugh. "'Yes,' replied the tortoise, "'and I get there sooner than you think. I'll run you a race and prove it.' 
The hare was much amused at the idea of running a race with the tortoise, but for the fun of the thing he agreed. So the fox, who had consented to act as judge, marked the distance and started the runners off. The hare was soon far out of sight, and to make the tortoise feel very deeply how ridiculous it was for him to try to race with a hare, he lay down beside the course to take a nap until the tortoise should catch up. The tortoise, meanwhile, kept going slowly but steadily, and after a time passed the place where the hare was sleeping. But the hare slept on very peacefully, and when at last he did wake up, the tortoise was near the goal. The hare now ran his swiftest, but he could not overtake the tortoise in time. The race is not always to the swift. THE BEES AND WASPS AND THE HORNET A store of honey had been found in a hollow tree, and the wasps declared positively that it belonged to them. The bees were just as sure that the treasure was theirs. The argument grew very pointed, and it looked as if the affair could not be settled without a battle, when at last, with much good sense, they agreed to let a judge decide the matter. So they brought the case before the hornet, justice of the peace in that part of the woods. When the judge called the case, witnesses declared that they had seen certain winged creatures in the neighborhood of the hollow tree, who hummed loudly, and whose bodies were striped, yellow and black, like bees. Counsel for the wasps immediately insisted that this description fitted his clients exactly. Such evidence did not help Judge Hornet to any decision, so he adjourned court for six weeks to give him time to think it over. When the case came up again, both sides had a large number of witnesses. An aunt was first to take the stand, and was about to be cross-examined when a wise old bee addressed the court. "'Your Honor,' he said, "'the case has now been pending for six weeks. If it is not decided soon, the honey will not be fit for anything.' I move that the bees and the wasps be both instructed to build a honeycomb. Then we shall soon see to whom the honey really belongs. The wasps protested loudly. Wise Judge Hornet quickly understood why they did so. They knew they could not build a honeycomb and fill it with honey. It is clear, said the judge, who made the comb and who could not have made it. The honey belongs to the bees. Ability proves itself by deeds. THE LARK AND HER YOUNG ONES A lark made her nest in a field of young wheat. As the days passed, the wheat stalks grew tall, and the young birds too grew in strength. Then one day, when the ripe golden grain waved in the breeze, the farmer and his son came into the field. "'This wheat is now ready for reaping,' said the farmer. "'We must call in our neighbors and friends to help us harvest it.' The young larks in their nest close by were much frightened, for they knew they would be in great danger if they did not leave the nest before the reapers came. When the mother lark returned with food for them, they told her what they had heard. "'Do not be frightened, children,' said the mother lark. If the farmer said he would call in his neighbors and friends to help him do his work, this wheat will not be reaped for a while yet. A few days later, the wheat was so ripe that when the wind shook the stalks, a hail of wheat grains came rustling down on the young lark's heads. "'If this wheat is not harvested at once,' said the farmer, "'we shall lose half the crop. We cannot wait any longer for help from our friends. Tomorrow we must set to work ourselves.' When the young larks told their mother what they had heard that day, she said, "'Then we must be off at once.' When a man decides to do his own work and not depend on anyone else, then you may be sure there will be no more delay. There was much fluttering and trying out of wings that afternoon, and at sunrise next day, when the farmer and his son cut down the grain, they found an empty nest. Self-help is the best help. THE CAT AND THE OLD RAT There was once a cat who was so watchful that a mouse hardly dared show the tip of his whiskers for fear of being eaten alive. That cat seemed to be everywhere at once, with his claws all ready for a pounce. At last the mice kept so closely to their dens that the cat saw he would have to use his wits well to catch one. So one day he climbed up on a shelf and hung from it, head downward, 
as if he were dead, holding himself up by clinging to some ropes with one paw. When the mice peeped out and saw him in that position, they thought he had been hung up there in punishment for some misdeed. Very timidly at first they stuck out their heads and sniffed about carefully, but as nothing stirred, all trooped joyfully out to celebrate the death of the cat. Just then the cat let go his hold, and before the mice recovered from their surprise, he had made an end of three or four. Now the mice kept more strictly at home than ever, but the cat, who was still hungry for mice, knew more tricks than one. Rolling himself in flour until he was covered completely, he lay down in the flour bin with one eye open for the mice. Sure enough, the mice soon began to come out. To the cat it was almost as if he had already had a plump young mouse under his claws, when an old rat, who had had much experience with cats and traps, and had even lost a part of his tail to pay for it, sat up at a safe distance from a hole in the wall where he lived. "'Take care,' he cried. "'That may be a heap of meal, but it looks to me very much like the cat. Whatever it is, it is wisest to keep at a safe distance.' The wise do not let themselves be tricked a second time. End of section 32「Section 33 of The Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Ingle. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Fox and the Crow. One bright morning, as the fox was following his sharp nose through the wood, in search of a bite to eat, he saw a crow on the limb of a tree overhead. This was by no means the first crow the fox had ever seen. What caught his attention this time, and made him stop for a second look, was that the lucky crow held a bit of cheese in her beak. No need to search any farther, thought sly Master Fox. Here is a dainty bite for my breakfast. Up he trotted to the foot of the tree in which the crow was sitting, and looked up admiringly. He cried, "'Good morning, beautiful creature!' The crow, her head cocked on one side, watched the fox suspiciously. But she kept her beak tightly closed on the cheese and did not return his greeting. "'What a charming creature she is!' said the fox. "'How her feathers shine! What a beautiful form and what splendid wings! Such a wonderful bird should have a very lovely voice since everything else about her is so perfect. Could she just sing one song? I know I would hail her queen of the birds. Listening to these flattering words, the crow forgot all her suspicion and also her breakfast. She wanted very much to be called the queen of the birds. So she opened her beak wide to utter her loudest caw, and down fell the cheese straight into the fox's open mouth. Thank you, said Master Fox sweetly as he walked off. Though it is cracked, you have a voice, sure enough. But where are your wits? The flatterer lives at the expense of those who will listen to him. The Ass and Its Shadow A traveler had hired an ass to carry him to a distant part of the country. The owner of the ass went with the traveler, walking beside him to drive the ass and point out the way. The road led across a treeless plain where the sun beat down fiercely. So intense did the heat become that the traveller at last decided to stop for a rest, and as there was no other shade to be found the traveller sat down in the shadow of the ass. Now the heat had affected the driver as much as it had the traveller, and even more for he had been walking. Wishing also to rest in the shade cast by the ass, he began to quarrel with the traveller, saying he had hired the ass and not the shadow it cast. The two soon came to blows, and while they were fighting, the ass took to its heels. In quarrelling about the shadow, we often lose the substance. The miller, his son, and the ass. One day, a long time ago, an old miller and his son were on their way to the market with an ass which they hoped to sell. They drove him very slowly, for they thought they would have a better chance to sell him if they kept him in good condition. As they walked along the highway, some travellers laughed loudly at them. 
"'What foolishness!' cried one. "'To walk when they might as well ride. The most stupid of the three is not the one you would expect it to be.' The miller did not like to be laughed at, so he told his son to climb up and ride. They had gone a little farther along the road when three merchants passed by. "'Oh, ho! What have we here?' they cried. "'Respect old age, young man. Get down and let the old man ride.' Though the miller was not tired, he made the boy get down and climbed up himself to ride, just to please the merchants. At the next turnstile they overtook some women carrying market-baskets, loaded with vegetables and other things to sell. "'Look at the old fool!' exclaimed one of them, perched on the ass while that poor boy has to walk. The miller felt a bit vexed, but to be agreeable he told the boy to climb up behind him. They had no sooner started out again than a loud shout went up from another company of people on the road. "'What a crime!' cried one, "'to load up a poor dumb beast like that. They look more able to carry the poor creature than he to carry them. They must be on their way to sell the poor thing's hide,' said another. The miller and his son quickly scrambled down, and a short time later the marketplace was thrown into an uproar as the two came along carrying the donkey slung from a pole. A great crowd of people ran to get a closer look at the strange sight. The ass did not dislike being carried, but so many people came up to point at him and laugh and shout that he began to kick and bray, and then, just as they were crossing a bridge, the ropes that held him gave way, and down he tumbled into the river. The poor miller now set out sadly for home. By trying to please everybody he had pleased nobody, and lost his ass besides. If you try to please all, you please none. THE ANT AND THE DOVE A dove saw an ant fall into a brook. The ant struggled in vain to reach the bank, and in pity the dove dropped a blade of straw close beside it. Clinging to the straw like a shipwrecked sailor to a broken spar, the ant floated safely to shore. Soon after the ant saw a man getting ready to kill the dove with a stone, but just as he cast the stone the ant stung him in the heel, so that the pain made him miss his aim, and the startled dove flew to safety in a distant wood. A kindness is never wasted. End of section 33 Recording by Jill Ingle Section 34 of the Aesop for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claire. The Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Man and the Satyr. A long time ago a man met a satyr in the forest and succeeded in making friends with him. The two soon became the best of comrades living together in the man's hut. But one cold winter evening, as they were walking homeward, the satyr saw the man blow on his fingers. "'Why do you do that?' asked the satyr. "'To warm my hands,' the man replied. When they reached home, the man prepared two bowls of porridge. These he placed steaming hot on the table, and the comrades sat down very cheerfully to enjoy the meal. But much to the satyr's surprise, the man began to blow into his bowl of porridge. "'Why do you do that?' he asked. "'To cool my porridge,' replied the man. The satyr sprang hurriedly to his feet and made for the door. "'Good-bye,' he said. "'I've seen enough. A fellow that blows hot and cold in the same breath cannot be friends with me.' The man who talks for both sides is not to be trusted by either. The Wolf, the Kid, and the Goat Mother Goat was going to market one morning to get provisions for her household, which consisted of but one little kid and herself. "'Take good care of the house, my son,' she said to the kid, as she carefully latched the door. "'Do not let anyone in unless he gives you this password. "'Down with the wolf and all his race!' Strangely enough, a wolf was lurking near and heard what the goat had said. So as soon as Mother Goat was out of sight, he, up he trotted to the door and knocked. "'Down with the wolf and all his race!' said the wolf softly. It was the right password, but when the kid peeped through a crack in the door and saw the shadowy figure outside, he did not feel at all easy. "'Show me a white paw,' he said, "'or I won't let you in.' 
A white paw, of course, is a feature few wolves can show, and so Master Wolf had to go away as hungry as he had come. You can never be too sure, said the kid, when he saw the wolf making off to the woods. Two sureties are better than one. The Swallow and the Crow The Swallow and the Crow had an argument one day about their plumage. Said the Swallow, Just look at my bright and downy feathers. Your black stiff quills are not worth having. Why don't you dress better? Show a little pride. Your feathers may do very well in spring, replied the Crow, but I don't remember ever having seen you around in winter, and that's when I enjoy myself most. Friends in fine weather only are not worth much. Jupiter and the Monkey There once was a baby show among the animals in the forest. Jupiter provided the prize. Of course, all the proud mamas from far and near brought their babies, but none got there earlier than Mother Monkey. Proudly she presented her baby among the other contestants. As you can imagine, there was quite a laugh when the animals saw the ugly, flat-nosed, hairless, pop-eyed little creature. Laugh if you will, said the Mother Monkey. Though Jupiter may not give him the prize, I know that he is the prettiest, the sweetest, the dearest darling in the world. Mother love is blind. End of section 34 Recording by Claire Section 35 of The Aesop for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jackie Horn The Aesop for Children by Aesop The Lion, the Ass, and the Fox A lion, an ass, and a fox were hunting in company and caught a large quantity of game. The ass was asked to divide the spoil. This he did very fairly, giving each an equal share. The fox was well satisfied, but the lion flew into a great rage over it, and with one stroke of his huge paw he added the ass to the pile of slain. Then he turned to the fox. You divide it, he roared angrily. The fox wasted no time in talking. He quickly piled all the game into one great heap. From this he took a very small portion for himself, such undesirable bits as the horns and hooves of a mountain goat and the end of an ox tail. The lion now recovered his good humor entirely. Who taught you to divide so fairly? he asked pleasantly. I learned a lesson from the ass, replied the fox, carefully edging away. Learn from the misfortunes of others. The Lion's Share A long time ago, the lion, the fox, the jackal, and the wolf agreed to go hunting together, sharing with each other whatever they found. One day, the wolf ran down a stag and immediately called his comrades to divide the spoil. Without being asked, the lion placed himself at the head of the feast to do the carving, and, with a great show of fairness, began to count the guests. One, he said, counting on his claws, that is myself the lion. Two, that's the wolf. Three is the jackal, and the fox makes four. He then very carefully divided the stag into four equal parts. I am King Lion, he said when he had finished, so of course I get the first part. The next part falls to me because I am the strongest, and this is mine because I am the bravest. He now began to glare at the others very savagely. If any of you have any claim to the part that is left, he growled, stretching his claws meaningly, now is the time to speak up. Might makes right. The Mole and His Mother A little mole once said to his mother, Why, mother, you said I was blind, but I am sure I can see. Mother Mole saw she would have to get such conceit out of his head. So she put a bit of frankincense before him and asked him to tell what it was. The little mole peered at it. Why, that's a pebble! Well, my son, that proves you've lost your sense of smell as well as being blind. Boast of one thing, and you will be found lacking in that and a few other things as well. The North Wind and the Sun the north wind and the sun had a quarrel about which of them was the stronger. While they were disputing with much heat and bluster, 
a traveller passed along the road wrapped in a cloak. Let us agree, said the son, that he is the stronger who can strip that traveller of his cloak. Very well, growled the north wind, and at once he sent a cold, howling blast against the traveller. With the first gust of the wind, the ends of the cloak whipped about the traveller's body, but he immediately wrapped it closely around him, and the harder the wind blew, the tighter he held it to him. The north wind tore angrily at the cloak, but all his efforts were in vain. Then the sun began to shine. At first his beams were gentle, and in the pleasant warmth after the bitter cold of the north wind, the traveller unfastened his cloak and let it hang loosely from his shoulders. The sun's rays grew warmer and warmer. The man took off his cap and mopped his brow. At last he became so heated that he pulled off his cloak and, to escape the blazing sunshine, threw himself down in the welcome shade of a tree by the roadside. Gentleness and kind persuasion win where force and bluster fail. End of section 35 Recording by Jackie Horn, Laytonsville, Maryland Section 36 of The Aesop for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aesop for Children Fables 141 to 144 by Aesop the hare and his ears the lion had been badly hurt by the horns of a goat which he was eating he was very angry to think that any animal that he chose for a meal should be so brazen as to wear such dangerous things as horns to scratch him while he ate so he commanded that all animals with horns should leave his domains within twenty-four hours the command struck terror among the beasts all those who were so unfortunate as to have horns began to pack up and move out even the hare who as you know has no horns and so had nothing to fear passed a very restless night dreaming awful dreams about the fearful lion and when he came out of the warren in the early morning sunshine and there saw the shadow cast by his long and pointed ears a terrible fright seized him good-bye neighbor cricket he called i'm off he will certainly make out that my ears are horns no matter what i say do not give your enemies the slightest reason to attack your reputation your enemies will seize any excuse to attack you the wolves and the sheep a pack of wolves lurked near the sheep pasture but the dogs kept them all at a respectful distance and the sheep grazed in perfect safety but now the wolves thought of a plan to trick the sheep why is there always this hostility between us they said if it were not for those dogs who are always stirring up trouble i am sure we should get along beautifully send them away and you will see what good friends we shall become the sheep were easily fooled they persuaded the dogs to go away and that very evening 
the wolves had the grandest feast of their lives do not give up friends for foes the cock and the fox a fox was caught in a trap one fine morning because he had got too near the farmer's hen-house no doubt he was hungry but that was not an excuse for stealing a cock rising early discovered what had happened he knew the fox could not get at him so he went a little closer to get a good look at his enemy the fox saw a slender chance of escape dear friend he said i was just on my way to visit a sick relative when i stumbled into this string and got all tangled up but please do not tell anybody about it i dislike causing sorrow to anybody and i am sure i can soon gnaw this string to pieces but the cock was not to be so easily fooled he soon roused the whole hen-yard and when the farmer came running out that was the end of mr fox the wicked deserve no aid the ass in the lion's skin an ass found a lion's skin left in the forest by a hunter he dressed himself in it and amused himself by hiding in a thicket and rushing out suddenly at the animals who passed that way all took to their heels the moment they saw him the ass was so pleased to see the animals running away from him just as if he were king lion himself that he could not keep from expressing his delight by a loud harsh bray a fox who ran with the rest stopped short as soon as he heard the voice approaching the ass he said with a laugh if you had kept your mouth shut you might have frightened me too but you gave yourself away with that silly bray a fool may deceive by his dress and appearance but his words will soon show what he really is End of section 36 Recording by Susan Morin, Portland, Maine Section 37 of the Aesop for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the Aesop for Children by Aesop. The Fisherman and the Little Fish A poor fisherman, who lived on the fish he caught, had bad luck one day and caught nothing but a very small fry. The fisherman was about to put it in his basket when the little fish said, Please spare me, Mr. Fisherman. I am so small, it is not worth while to carry me home. When I am bigger, I shall make you a much better meal but the fisherman quickly put the fish into his basket how foolish i should be he said to throw you back however small you may be you are better than nothing at all a small gain is worth more than a large promise the fighting cocks and the eagle once there were two cocks living in the same farmyard who could not bear the sight of each other at last one day they flew up to fight it out beak and claw 
They fought until one of them was beaten and crawled off to a corner to hide. The cock that had won the battle flew to the top of the hen-house, and proudly flapping his wings crowed with all his might to tell the world about his victory. But an eagle, circling overhead, heard the boasting chanticleer, and, swooping down, carried him off to his nest. His rival saw the deed, and coming out of his corner, took his place as master of the farmyard. Pride goes before a fall. End of section 37 End of the Aesop for Children by Aesop Section 31 of the Aesop for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claire The Aesop for Children by Aesop The Stag, the Sheep, and the Wolf One day a stag came to a sheep and asked her to lend him a measure of wheat. The sheep knew him for a very swift runner who could easily take himself out of reach were he so inclined. So she asked him if he knew someone who would answer for him. Yes, yes, answered the stag confidently. The wolf has promised to be my surety. The wolf, exclaimed the sheep indignantly. Do you think I would trust you on such security? I know the wolf. He takes what he wants and runs off with it without paying. As for you, you can use your legs so well that I should have little chance of collecting the debt if I had to catch you for it. Two blacks do not make a white. The Animals and the Plague Once upon a time a severe plague raged among the animals. Many died, and those who lived were so ill that they cared for neither food nor drink, and dragged themselves about listlessly. No longer could a fat young hen tempt Master Fox to dinner, nor a tender lamb rouse greedy Sir Wolf's appetite. At last the lion decided to call a council. When all the animals were gathered together, he arose and said, Dear friends, I believe the gods have sent this plague upon us as a punishment for our sins. Therefore the most guilty one of us must be offered in sacrifice. Perhaps we may thus obtain forgiveness and cure for all. I will confess all my sins first. I admit I have been very greedy and have devoured many sheep. They have done me no harm. I have eaten goats and bulls and stags. To tell the truth, I even ate up a shepherd now and then. Now if I am the most guilty, I am ready to be sacrificed. But I think it best that each one confess his sins as I have done. Then we can decide in all justice who is the most guilty. Your Majesty, said the fox, you are too good. Can it be a crime to eat sheep, such stupid mutton heads? No, no, your Majesty, you have done them great honour by eating them up. And so far as shepherds are concerned, we all know they belong to that puny race that pretends to be our masters. All the animals applauded the fox loudly. Then, though the tiger, the bear, the wolf, and all the savage beasts recited the most wicked deeds, all were excused and made to appear very saint-like and innocent. Now it was the ass's turn to confess. I remember, he said guiltily, that one day as I was passing a field belonging to some priests, I was so tempted by the tender grass and my hunger that I could not resist nibbling a bit of it. I had no right to it, I admit. A great uproar among the beasts interrupted him. Here was the culprit who had brought misfortune on all of them. What a horrible crime it was to eat grass that belonged to someone else. It was enough to hang anyone for so much more an ass. Immediately they all fell upon him, the wolf in the lead, and soon had made an end to him, sacrificing him to the gods then and there, and without the formality of an altar. The weak are made to suffer for the misdeeds of the powerful. The Shepherd and the Lion A shepherd, counting his sheep one day, discovered that a number of them were missing. Much irritated, he very loudly and boastfully declared that he would catch the thief and punish him as he deserved. The shepherd suspected a wolf of the deed, and so set out toward a rocky region among the hills, where there were caves infested by wolves. But before starting out, he made a vow to Jupiter that if he would help him find the thief, he would offer a fat calf as a sacrifice. The shepherd searched a long time without finding any wolves, but just as he was passing near a large cave on the mountain side, 
a huge lion stalked out, carrying a sheep. In great terror the shepherd fell on his knees. Alas, O Jupiter, man does not know what he asked. To find the thief I offered to sacrifice a fat calf. Now I promise you a full-grown bull, if you but make the thief go away. We are often not so eager for what we seek after we have found it. Do not foolishly ask for things that would bring ruin if they were granted. THE DOG AND HIS REFLECTION A dog, to whom the butcher had thrown a bone, was hurrying home with his prize as fast as he could go. As he crossed a narrow footbridge, he happened to look down and saw himself reflected in the quiet water, as if in a mirror. But the greedy dog thought he saw a real dog carrying a bone much bigger than his own. If he had stopped to think, he would have known better. But instead of thinking, he dropped his bone and sprang at the dog in the river, only to find himself swimming for dear life to reach the shore. At last he managed to scramble out, but as he stood sadly thinking about the good bone he had lost, he realized what a stupid dog he had been. It is very foolish to be greedy. End of section 31 Recording by Claire